Okay, this is part two of uh, labor supply theory. Um, I know that other one was kind of long and had a lot of very tricky stuff in it. Um, so you may want to watch that one a couple more times and make sure you have that down uh, before you watch this uh, much shorter one. Um, what I want to point out first uh, are just a couple of ways in which the, um, the model doesn't exactly reflect um, what we see in real labor markets. The most obvious is that in our model the worker chooses the optimal number of work hours um, and that's probably you know there's some reality to that but um, the worker can't just go into the their employer and say yeah, I've chosen to work 42 hours a week or I've chosen to work 38 and a half hours a week um, employers set work schedules a lot of times 40 hours or 35 hours or 20 hours depending on what the job is but these are an institutional constraint on individual choice and so we can sometimes get some disequilibrium results somebody who wants to work 45 hours a week but is only working 40 or someone who wants to work 35 but has, is forced to to choose to work 40 um, over time though this um, this canon will change and we'll talk about that a little bit later but if too many of the workers in the economy are in disequilibrium um, we would expect these employer set work schedules to change as well. Uh, these for the 40 hour work week is after all the result of some interaction of, of employers and employees. Um, it's not just employers arbitrarily deciding that 40 hours is the right amount of time um, for somebody to work. So um, so this can change over time but in, in the short run it can lead to some disequilibrium. Another thing that our model didn't include but is very easy to build into the model if you want to um, are the time and money costs of working. Now the time costs of working involve um, you know, the commute, for example. Uh, money costs of working can include things like having to pay for childcare while you're at work or having to buy lunch every day when you go to work or having to buy a uniform um, for your job. If it's a fixed time cost, a certain amount of time that you spend, say, commuting, uh, each week, then all you do is take that budget constraint that we looked at last time and you shift it to the left. Rather than starting with 100 available hours, you start with, say, 90 if you spend 10 hours a week commuting. Um, so that's just a lep leopard shift of the budget constraint. It will obviously lead to a different um, optimal choice and lower utility. A fixed money cost is a money cost that does not change with the hours of, uh, worked. So a uniform might be a good example of a fixed money cost. It doesn't matter whether you work 10 hours a week or 40, you need the uniform. Um, and so this is just going to be a downward shift in the budget constraint. If there is some non-labor income, it would just shift down um, uh, from that point. If there is no other non-labor income, then it would just shift down um, so that the uh, point at which you had zero income would be a point where you actually spent a few hours working. Um, and if it's a variable money cost, um, this is something that would would be affected by the number of hours you work. So this might be child care, for example. Every hour you work, you need to pay somebody for an hour to to watch um, your child. Uh, this is just going to flatten the budget constraint by changing the effective wage. So you earn a certain number of dollars per hour, and then you pay a certain number of dollars per hour for child care. Okay. Um, we can also use this model not just to talk about an individual's static choice of how much labor to supply, but also to talk about trends over time. Um, this is what I referenced earlier. In 1900, the average worker worked 53 hours a week. In 2003, that number had fallen to just under 40. Um, so we can ask, is there anything consistent with this model that's changed in sort of that 100-year period? And yeah, in that period, real wages in the economy increased by more than 700%. So what we have is that budget constraint getting steeper and steeper and steeper um, over time. Recall that an increase in the wage can lead to more or less leisure, so it must be that the income effect dominated uh, for um, workers in the economy over that entire time period. This does not mean, however, that for each individual worker at any moment in time the income effect dominates. Remember that an income effect um, would lead to a negatively sloped labor supply curve. This can be true for all workers added up in the economy while not being true for individual workers. And I'm not really going to bother you with the, the, the math behind that, but, um, but to assume that just because workers have upward sloping labor supply curves and therefore 
the entire labor market has an upward sloping labor supply curve for a hundred year period. Um, that's something that's called the fallacy of composition. Um, and uh, so just because one worker in one week behaves a certain way doesn't mean that all workers over the last hundred years have behaved that same way when added together. Um, so if the income effect dominated over that time, that would explain why workers were choosing more and more leisure. Um, and that's almost certainly the case. You know, standard of, standards of living are so much higher, not just because we earn more and we produce more and we consume more, but also because we have more leisure. If we all still worked 53 hours a week, we would have a lot more stuff. Um, but we've made our choice that we'd rather have uh, trade off some of that stuff for more time spent in leisure. Now, in recent decades, um, starting in about the 80s, this the work week has kind of leveled off. Um, so this hasn't been uh, decreasing the entire time. It decreased until about the 80s, to, uh, and then it's kind of leveled off since then. And so we would ask, you know, sort of, why is it? Why don't we still continue to choose more and more leisure? Why is the trend not to, um, not still moving in that direction? Well, there are a few different explanations, possible explanations for this. Uh, one is an increase in paid vacation. The fact is, we're getting paid for the same amount of time, but we're actually spending more time in leisure. So it's not that we are not taking more leisure, it's that we don't see it in the data, because our leisure time is paid. Um, and uh, so this would just, this would indicate that, that it's a measurement problem, really. Um, also, we can still be getting more lifetime leisure if we live longer even without having to work less while we work. So we don't have to expect that that number is going to continue to drop below 40 hours per week. Uh, if people's lives are extending, then they will have more lifetime leisure. And in as much as people are lifetime utility maximizers, this could be a possible explanation. Um, and this is an explanation that's been advanced in the literature. Um, I'd say that this one falls a little short because nothing spectacular has happened to life expectations since the 1980s. And so um, it has this explanation. I think it can't be everything. There are some other explanations. Um, raising the baby boom generation was very expensive because it was a very big generation, and so um, people had to work, and so that uh, you know that trend could have slowed down there. Social Security also provides some perverse incentives um, to retire earlier but work more while you're working, because of course you know that your Social Security benefits are based on your highest years of earnings, and so that gives you an incentive to have years of high earnings, which means working a lot. In the absence of Social Security, somebody might spread out their work over their whole life, work until they were 75, but work on average less each year. Uh, so that's a possible explanation. Again, not a lot of reason to think that this changed you know, any time in the 80s, but uh, it could have done it. Also, it could just be a change in preferences, that we have enough leisure now and we don't really prefer any more. Um, in recent years, up until 2005, um, probably if you look at the data now, this may not be the case, but work hours had actually started to increase a little bit more. Uh, and there are some reasons for that. The first is demographics. Anything that we're talking about in this class, and we're talking about changes over time, the baby boom generation is going to be a part of that explanation. So as the baby boom generation moved into the, their, the, their later working years, you know, people in their later working years work more than do young workers. So we have this gigantic generation of people that moved through the labor force together um, as they aged. And so, you know, we have these people now at the end of their working life where they're likely to be working the most. And so it's really just a, a matter of changing the makeup of the, of the labor force um, as they change the average age of, of the worker and so on. Recently, real wages have declined a little bit, so this, you know, if the income effect still dominated, this could explain it. Um, changing consumption patterns could, could explain this if we um, are becoming, I don't know, less materialistic or more materialistic or something. Uh, also, moonlighting is um, more and more common. Um, still, it's surprising not a lot of people in the economy do this. It's, it's, um, it's less than a twelfth of the people in the economy uh, work a second job but uh, it's becoming more and more popular. Um, so that's all I really wanted to add to this model. Um, I think there's a lot to, to work through in this, so if you have any questions, please uh, contact me. And also, I want you to pay attention to the readings and how uh, that discussion, uh, 
those discussions of, of those labor supply issues um, affect the model uh, because we just sort of um, you know assumed that there was a given wage but that wage must come from somewhere uh, and we learned in our labor demand uh, lesson that it's some it's based on productivity um, and uh, we assumed that there was a given set of preferences but those preferences must reflect something else about workers so I think as you look through those other readings maybe having understood um, the basics of this labor supply stuff will, will help.